go. Story's gone. All right. Um, I can slow down a little bit, maybe. All right. I have carburetor disadvantages. There's no carburetor. There isn't any. They kind of convince me that they rock. Yeah, I like them. They don't rock upside down. <coughs> you have a carb that's in the secret system, though? No. No, you cannot go inverted with a carburetor. At all? Oh, you can. It just won't run. <laughs> like, there is the Cessna 150 Aerobat. That's a, that's a great example of a... Just got no 200 on the front with a gravity-fed carburetor. When they go upside down, they lose oil pressure and they lose the engine. Oh, well, you can be that like even just like a zero or a negative, negative G. Well, yeah, I was just well, trying to get another carburetor upside, uh, down. upside down on top of it. Yeah. Yes, and then when you went the other way, it would all run out. So, no, you can't. You can't go upside down. So, well, that's actually my uh, thing right here. They don't work upside down. Okay, yes. Yeah, so there is that point. If you keep a positive G, a positive, uh, like an aileron with a positive G going, then yes, they'll keep working. But at the minute you literally go upside down and try and fly upside down, it won't work. So they do not work upside down. They still work at a pretty decent I've never had one quit on me, and I, I'll do 90 banks. Or okay. I, yeah, I've done more than 90 banks. But you still have positive G on it. Because you're mm -hmm. in a hard turn? In a, in a, yeah, in a, yeah, you okay. still have. So everybody understand there, there's a difference. So in airplanes, you can keep a positive G, so the carburetor has no idea it just went upside down because you're keeping the gravity going down through the carburetor, even though it's going upside down. But you can't do that if you fly upside down and try and fly any distance upside down, then it instantly stops. But you can do it like a quick roll or something like that. Um, let's see. Um, kind of a slow throttle response. Again, it is really considered bad form to accelerate an aircraft quickly for a lot of reasons. So if you're running aircraft engines, you run them, especially as a mechanic, when you don't own the engine, it's very slowly on, very slowly off. Everything happens slow. Uh, a lot of reasons. One, it's hard on the propeller. Uh, if you've ever seen stop animation type or slow motion videos of propellers as they're actually going through power changes, they look like rubber bands. I mean, they are just wavy and doing all kinds of weirdness and uh, I don't like looking at that. I wouldn't, I don't want to fly one if I see that too much. Um, you have, you guys know you have the counterweights, you can detune counterweights in the engine. Um, yeah, it's all bad, bad, bad. So don't do that. Um, a form ice, form ice. Um, I have the word easily here. I don't know about that. I don't, like I said, I haven't had ice problems, but some people do. I think it's just mostly because where I live. If I lived in the someplace else, I'd probably experience a lot more ice. They form ice easily as compared to other. Yes. Ice is most likely to happen when? At idle with low manifold pressures. Yeah. So as a matter of fact, as a pilot of a carbureted aircraft, before you make a major power reduction to idle, like so from the land, you come to your spot where you're going to pull the power back, you reach over and you pull carb heat on full, then you pull your power. And you keep the carb heat on all the way down until you land. And then if you're doing a very long descent with no power, then we actually, you actually like add the power every, I don't know, 30 seconds, minute or something. Make sure you still have power. You don't want to need it and go, oh, whew, when did that quit? Um, ice can form, carb ice, um, can form on the Venturi, even in hot weather. Yep. Why? Why can we get ice in hot weather? I mean, it's 
too hot for ice, isn't it? Yeah, what else? As fuel vaporizes, what does it need to vaporize? Sucks out the heat. As fuel vaporizes, the temp drops. Remember the latent heat of vaporization? In order for this to happen, it's got to get heat from somewhere, so it's going to take it from the metal parts. Take it from the metal parts, they're going to get cold. When they get cold, they ice up. Um, let's see what the temp drops there. Well, obviously, when temps are below uh, 32 degrees, 32 degrees F, what happens at 32 degrees F? Okay, moisture in the air. Air can uh, freeze into the venturi. Onto the venturi. Or throttle plate. So we can get ice. Um, let me see. It can happen. This is crazy. It can happen with. Oh, it's oat. O A T. Outside air temp. Hey, outside air temp. From 32 to 100 degrees. Which is kind of a weird thing, because like this statement out of this book said when temps are below 32, moisture in the air can freeze onto the venturi. And it also says here, what well, can happen with outside from 32 to 100, which means that when you go below 32, it's not going to happen. So which one is it? I almost feel like this number four here, I got to look into that one. When you're below 32, the water's already frozen. So if it's already frozen, it's not going to get in through the air cleaner. So I have some doubts about this one, even though book said that. And on my airplane, let me see. Yeah. This right here, let me see. They have this. Nope. Um, one of the gauges that I have in mind, right here where this one is up in the upper right, because I don't have fuel pressure, I have carb temp. And it is like that with a yellow area right in the middle. And so if the needle is, oh, look at that, better yellow. Probably can't even see the yellow. Um, so if the needle is up here, it's too hot for ice. I don't have to worry about it. If it's down here, it's too cold. It's right when it's in the middle. And so and I've been reading about or reading what other people do. I, I just don't care. If it's, mine's right there, I'm like, eh, whatever. Um, if I see a, a loss of power, then I'll, I'll put the carb heat on. Otherwise, I don't worry about it. Um, but some people, they freak out when their temp's right in here. It's like, oh, my gosh, we're going to ice up. So I'm like, yeah, if you ice up, it's not a big deal. Pull the car beat on. It'll melt it, and you'll be fine. Um, but just off the, it's while we're on that topic, um, like with my airplane, because of the uneven fuel distribution, a lot of people say that if you pull the car beat on just a little, it helps better fuel distribution. But I'm like, yeah. So on top of that skepticism that you had about that drop below 32 yeah. degrees, you meant like we were looking at the POH for your aircraft. Yeah. It was Celsius. Those Celsius. are in Celsius. Yeah. Okay. So still, I mean, you're not always seeing. Oh, I've flown in fr freezing temperatures yeah. before. And you don't have any. I still didn't. Yeah. No, and it was a really cloudy day. I mean, it was like it was a weird, weird day. I can still picture it in my mind. It was like, if you look down carefully, you could see the ground because we were above a, a snow layer, and then it was like this. We weren't between layers. But it was like, it, you could hardly see the horizon, it felt like, because it was just such a haze everywhere. And it was cold. I mean, it was really freaking cold. And uh, it still didn't nice up. I kept waiting for it to happen. Just go, I'll just see what it's like. But it didn't. 
But the cabin was warm. Um, as ice forms, let me see, as ice forms, as ice forms, mixture becomes richer. Let's try to think why. It seems like you're adding more of the restriction to your venturi so the velocity would be faster. Yeah. Or just less airflow too. Yeah, but if you get less airflow and you don't get it through the venturi, then you're not going to get the fuel. So it's going to depend on where it is. So okay. if so I I believe this is partly right. It's going to depend on where it is. So if it starts forming around the throttle plate, then it's going to be a restriction. It's going to restrict fuel and air going in, and you're just going to start losing power. Uh, like your, if it's around the Venturi, then it's going to it increase in velocity, but it's also going to be a restriction. So even that one. I, I it seems like it would also that you remove the moisture from the air, dry the air out, and make the air denser, which would actually ruin it. I know that's not what happens. Yeah, I don't think it has anything to do with the, pulling the moisture out. That's what I was saying, a blockage. So if we start restricting everything, it's like closing the throttle, right? And when you close the throttle, what happens? You lose power. So you lose power. So that's a fact. So you're going to lose power. So I'm going to check on that richer one, um, although this is true. Eventually, ice will shut down the engine. Uh, let's see. So what do we do about ice? All right, so ice prevention slash removal. It depends on where you're going to get ice. So if we want to talk about induction icing, we could say there's two types. Induction ice. Um, one would be impact. That's where you're flying through ice and it's hitting the aircraft and it hits the air cleaner and it starts icing over the air cleaner where the air comes in. There's nothing you can do about that. It's just going to be there and it's going to block up the air inlet. So you need an alternate source of air. So if you have a carburetor, then you'll have a carburetor heater. And if you pull on the carburetor heater, it draws air from somewhere else, actually inside the cowling. So it's unfiltered air, but it's, it's warm air and you're fine. So you just pull on carb heat and it will bypass that filter. If you have a fuel injected engine or something that doesn't have a carb heat, what they do is they put magnetically operated doors. So it's an alternate air door that just closes with a magnet, magnetic strip. And so it's normally closed. And so you have air coming through the air cleaner, which kind of pressurizes that area going up into the carburetor. And it pushes that door clo uh, oh, no, closed. Yeah, it keeps it, keeps it on its, its latch. But if the filter starts to ice up and the engine is sucking air, now it's going to create a low pressure in that inlet chamber because you're blocking the inlet. So that low pressure will suck the door open and then it'll draw warm air around the alternate air door. It has lightweight springs that'll kind of latch it back close when the engine stops. So that's how you do that. Impact ice and then um, throttle ice. Throttle ice is the ice that forms in the carburetor. So how do we? So we know how to get rid of the impact. We just go to an alternate air source. Which is either literally the alternate air source is what it's called, or the carburetor heat will provide that. Um, my best uh, advice is uh, don't fly in the ice with a carburetor. Um, De-ice, which is uh, remove ice formed. So they don't put like a grid heater or anything like that in some filters? Assemblies? No. I've never seen that happen, no. 
No, and honestly, when you're up at altitude, you don't really need an air cleaner. Yeah, and if you have an aircraft that's known icing conditions, you're you're flying pretty high usually anyway. Those are pretty nice planes. Yeah, don't the have like TKS systems and stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's like the weeping wing. Yeah. Uh, okay, so how do we get rid of ice? Add car heat. What is carburetor heat? Where does it come from? I don't have this one. Yes. So it uses the. I want to be careful. I say this. Nobody thinks you're ingesting exhaust fumes. You're not. So you. Yeah. Just. So you have a muffler. For lack of a better term, <laughs> or an exhaust stack or an exhaust pipe, it depends on the system. And those exhaust pipes get super hot, right? I mean, they're at, as we know, exhaust gas temperature, 1400 degrees or more. And so those pipes are super hot. So if we took that super hot pipe and we just wrapped something around it with an airspace and then blew air through it, there you'd have air come in. Air would go on the outside of that very hot pipe, warming up the air, and then pipe it off to something else. Yeah. And that works fantastic until you have an exhaust leak. that little pipe gets a tiny hole. Then you get exhaust fumes into that heat. And if it goes to the cabin, everybody dies. If it goes to the engine, then you're, instead of getting oxygen, you're getting that, which is. You're telling me I don't even have to wait in the garage? I know. Let's go flying. Uh, this is this is a deadly thing, and the FAA is really trying to combat it. I heard a fantastic uh, podcast about a guy um, who was very self-aware of carbon monoxide poisoning. It was on his mind, and he was in his Mooney. And so, do you, do you know this one? He was up in the north. He had to fly like from like Michigan into Canada. I mean, he's up in that area in the middle of winter. It's super freaking cold. And, you know, as he's flying, he's thinking, you know, because he's using his carburetor heater, not, I mean, his cabin heater. We get cabin heat the same way. So it's just two systems. One goes to the cabin, one goes to the carb. So any, the slightest little leak in this will cause carbon monoxide poisoning. And he is very conscious of this. That's the whole point of the story. It's not like he was, didn't know. And uh, like, I, I'm conscious of it. If, if I'm around exhaust fumes, I instantly get a headache. It's the only reason why I ever get a headache, right? Um, and so, you know, you'd think you'd notice. But anyway, all of the things, all of the symptoms started happening to him and he never actually realized it. And it's through a system of events, you know, the Swiss cheese model or just one little thing lined up with one little thing, one little thing. And, uh, you know, he went there and he had his meeting and he, you know, takes off and it's kind of nighttime and he's flying. And they have recordings of him talking to ATC and his speech is starting to get really slurred. And uh, he, um, so it was nighttime and he says he, he, he dozed off. And when he woke up, his first thought was, damn, my windshield is really clean. I can see the stars so clearly. And then he started to realize it's quiet. And he's like, holy crap, I'm in the middle of a field and my windshield's gone. Oh, he crashed. He crashed. And so he had it trimmed for a, a climb and he kept climbing until he ran out of fuel. And, just... and then it stayed with that altitude and it, he found, it, the airplane just came in and smashed into an open field. It, yeah, planes glide. I mean, just, well, I know that, yeah. but if you're <laughs> fucking yeah, asleep with the wheel, angle, I mean, well, yeah, if you had the right angle, angle yeah, right it's angle. It, it like broke his back. I mean, he's not paralyzed, but you know, it, it broke some. He, um, his biggest problem, he had a back injury and a frostbite because he was unconscious for so long. But the big point of that story is he was aware of carbon monoxide poisoning and thinking about it and thinking, no, it's not that. And it was that. So, yeah. It's like uh, uh, nitrogen narcosis when you're diving. Yeah. And you're, you start acting. Because we're all divers. That's a yeah. good correlation to us all. <laughs> <laughs> when, uh, when you dive down, the nitrogen in your blood gets toxic. Can pressurize, and it, you get more nitrogen in your blood than you normally have, and it affects your the way your brain works. It slows you down like you're drunk, 
and they compare it to like every so many tens of feet. It's like adding a martini every five minutes. Let's go diving. It's like having four martinis at the same time. And they'll do Sounds like yeah. Sounds like yeah. I call that Saturday one. It's one of those everyone's like, oh no, I don't feel it. I feel fine. And then they'll come back up and they're like, holy crap, I feel over shit. Yeah. People didn't have carbon. They don't. They didn't believe in it. And so the type of carbon monoxide sensors that you would get were those stupid little, they come in a little bag and you tear them open and you'd stick them to your uh, instrument panel and they would turn a color if you had carbon monoxide. You need something to like yell at you. Yeah. Well, like when I went to uh, uh, Arkansas, I don't know where the hell I was going. Um, long cross country and the guy I worked with is like you do have carbon monoxide in your airplane I'm like no I'm pretty self aware of carbon monoxide yeah, and he went and got one he's like please you're a good friend I don't want to see you die take this Aww. and so yeah you know how many times I looked at that never <laughs> so I heard that podcast and that day I got home I went online and I bought a, a yeah CO2 that screams at you yeah. and so yeah um, so I had that one, but then I just bought a new one that's built into the century. So, yes. Carbon yeah. monoxide poisoning is a real idiot. Just don't let it affect you. <laughs> Something the man made up to keep us down. We're flying and the alarm went off. You just open the vent. Yes. Turn off Yep. Turn off. Turn off the cabin heat, and then open up the, my wing vents. Let, put your head out the window. Yeah. Put your head out the window. Yeah. <laughs> Long time. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So we have ice. What's going to happen? How do we know we have ice? Start losing power. How? What does losing power look like? RPM drop. RPM drop. Not in my plane. Manifold pressure is going down for some unknown reason. Airspeed starts dropping. All right, so I see that happening, right? Or fixed pitch starts, RPM is dropping, dropping, dropping. So what do I do? Add carb heat. So I'll reach over and pull the carb heat. What's going to happen? Suddenly the aircraft is going to run really freaking crappy. Things just went from bad to worse. So what do you do? I'm not doing that anymore. No, no, keep it in there, keep it in there. And then start running. Why did it get so why did it get so worse? Well, number one, you just added a bunch of hot air. Hot air is less dense. So the carburetor is gonna run rich. So now I just made the so it was running like crap. I'm losing power, and now what I'm gonna do is make it richer. That's not good, is it? It is good. That's not good. Well, better than what's gonna happen. It's so it's gonna run so it's gonna get richer, so the airplane's gonna run worse. Now, what am I gonna start ingesting? Ice. Ice and water. So it's gonna run rich, so I'm gonna start ingesting ice and water in the engine. It is not going to like it. Then what's gonna happen? Then suddenly it gets better all on its own. Well look at that. It got better. What happened? You cleared out all the ice. Push in the carb heat, and what's it gonna do? Run even better because I got rid of the over richness. Yeah. I'm not aware of electric de ice at all. Why add the weight, I guess? For the, the, yeah. For the carb, at least. I know. Yeah, no. I know. Yeah. 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 Blades, uh, let's see. Add carb heat. So we add carb heat. Uh, engine will be running rough. So engine will, let me see, be running rough or have loss of power. From ice, um, addition, so pull carb heat, um, addition of hot air, of hot air will enrich, the mixture more, or the mixture, um, which equals Runs even worse. Uh, in a carbureted aircraft, before you take off, you do a magneto check and you do a carb heat check. 
So you reach over, grab the carb heat, pull it on. You're going to see at about at 15, 700 RPM, about 150, 200 R, excuse me, 150 to 200 RPM drop. Okay, how much RPM? You said 1700? About 17. Uh, in my Cessna 150, I took off one time from a field in summer. And it was one of those things where uh, taking off is fun, but the first few minutes are not because it, I mean, it's fun, but you're like, please don't quit. Please don't quit. Please don't quit. Cause there's nothing you can do. You're just going to go, you, you need to pitch down, go forward and crash into whatever's in front of you. And that's your, that's your option. Or you can try and make it back to the airport and spin in and die. So I choose not to do that. Um, they call it the impossible turn because it's, you have to fight that urge to not go back to where safety is. You, you got to go forward. So I was right in that spot. I looked down, thought, if this engine quits, where do I go? Boom. I had a sudden 150 RPM drop. And you really notice that in the 150. And I'm like, oh, shit, I have my daughter with me. And I was like, oh, man. And I'm like, what, what happens now? And it kept running, but it dropped 150 that fast. And so I climbed up, and I thought, okay, it's running fine. Everything looks good. You know, got high enough. You are safe. Well, let's try the carb heat. Well, that doesn't do anything anymore. So guess what my problem is? Carb heat just came on and it's on. So, yeah, somebody put the wrong bolt in it. it just, okay. And so, somebody. like, a, I bought the plane. I didn't do it. <laughs> did you work on it? No, I think it was even before I did the first annual or, you know, you, it's just something you didn't notice. It was a quarter-inch bolt in the 5 16 inch hole. So it just rattled in there until it rattled All the, the arm off of the, uh, yeah. So, uh, okay, so that'll get it worse. Let me see. Um, carb heat adds. Oh, let me see. Carb heat adds about 100 degrees F. And what percent reduction of power is that? It's okay. I wrote it before, but wow, I wouldn't even remember that. I looked at my notes. Yeah, that's about. 150 10 oh yeah. Oh, we got math. Come on. That's about a 10% reduction in power. Yep. Um, as ice as ice is ingested. Um, engine runs even worse. Um, when all ice is gone, engine runs smooth-ish, because it's still rich, runs smooth with stable power, and when carb heat is off. My notes say when crab heat is off, but I know it's carb. When carb heat is off, is off, engine runs normally. So as a mechanic running up aircraft, when you likely to get ice at idle. at idle, what is the problem with? Um, Carb heat. Think like a mechanic. Oh, unfiltered air. Unfiltered air. So as I come in for a landing, I've got my carb heat on. Wheels touch down. What's the first thing I do? Turn it off. Turn it off. Carb heat off. So I go back to filtered air and flaps up. Because you get on the yep. Yeah, it's adjusting dirt. So you don't want that. So carb heat off. Uh, let me see. Yeah, stirring it up. Yep. Um, all right. I don't know where I was going with that. So I'll put carb heat equals unfiltered air. Don't want to do that. Although there's times when you kind of want to, like with my airplane because the filter's in the lower cowling with the duct to it, that's the lowest point. And my carb heat actually is taking air from a little bit higher point. 
So if I run my airplane on the ground for a test run after maintenance without the cowling on, then I do use carb heat because to not use carb heat is unfiltered air down low. To use carb heat is unfiltered air up high. So you have to think that through as a mechanic. If I have carb heat off and I don't have the cowling on, where is it sucking from? If I have the carb heat on, where is it sucking from? So for me, it's better without the cowling to have carb heat on. What's that? It's in the cowling. Oh, not, yeah, you, good point. So not all of them are that way, just okay. my airplane's that way. Uh, I think all the 150s, it's, it's built into it. Okay. Let me see. Is it a pre picture? Nope, it's past. So if it looks like that one, then the cleaner's right there, and you're good to go. But a lot of times, all of this stuff right here is not. Um, so you can see how the pipes run maybe right through there and this area. This is a home built of some sort, I don't know, I think. So then how does that work for putting it all together then? There's a hole in the cowling. Okay. So you just as you bring the cowling up and on, that's going to go. With like the cowling that has the cleaning element. Like mine? How does yeah. it work? Yeah, for putting the cowling back on. It just, oh, it sucks. Okay. So you put the cowling on. Then you have to go through the cowl flaps up in there and you have to attach the boot onto the carburetor and you're working through a little hole and then you have to bolt it up on there. Yeah, it's not fun. I don't enjoy it. It takes a very long time to take my cowling off. So I don't take it off for no reason, not even annuals. I'm just kidding. Um, let me see. Got some interesting notes here. Let's see where I'm going with this. I've already covered all this, actually. I don't even really need to say this. Always use the manufacturer's latest overhaul repair manual. Do I need to write that? No. Uh, always have current service bolts and service instructions and letters for the carburetor. You know what always comes first? Google search and a forum. <laughs> if you didn't hear him, he said uh, Google search and a forum. That's your best bet. Podcast. Yeah, podcast. Yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> is his dad a TV repairman? He has all kinds of cool tools. Yeah. There's probably only two of you that got that joke in here, if there's two. My dad's a TV repairman, he has all kinds of. That sounds original. There's one. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I know what you're talking about. It's dirty. Don't watch it. Uh, let's see. You can use drill bits to do what? On carburetors? What do you use drill bits for? <laughs> As a measuring tool, but of course, what would you need to do with a drill bit before you can use it as a measuring tool? Measure the drill bit. With a what? Calibrated. Calibrated micrometer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> when you're measuring the float level in a Stromberg carburetor, don't measure near near the edge. Correct, because of the never check a carburetor with. <laughs> he got it. <laughs> shop air. <laughs> never test uh, floats levels with uh, shop air. Um, If you find that your idle mixture, how do we know we have a good idle mixture? 50% 50 rise. 50 RPM rise. If you don't have that rise, what does that mean? It's too lean. Why is it suddenly, why is it too lean now when it wasn't before? Be specific. Was good. Why is it not now? What changed? Oh, the pushing and the throttle, the throttle plate thing. That Did what? Uh, it wore. What does that mean? Why does that matter? Why does that matter? 
too much air. Yeah, it's too, it's too, too, too much play, and then it doesn't close and open exactly anymore. Well. Nope. I'm trying to air leaks. I know, but a lot of people do say that. Well, it doesn't open and close the way it's supposed to. No. It's what? Uh, yeah. Air. You have an air leak. So everybody got that? Because I guarantee you at least six people last year said that on their oral. Why does it do that? Well, it just doesn't close quite right. <laughs> like, well, show me. What do you mean by not right? Well, you know. No, I don't know. Explain that. <laughs> Yes, so why is it not getting a rise? Because there is? There's an air leak. What is the most likely cause of the air leak? Or one cause? Yes, you have loose uh, bushings. The shaft and the bushings got wore out. That is one. What else could it be? A leak in, in a gasket somewhere. There's a lot of rubber couplings in these intake systems. You can get a, a hole in the rubber coupling. Um, Fuel injection systems have sniffle valves, sniffle valves. They're, they're little ball check valves that drop down and let fuel drain when the engine's not running, but when you start the engine, the little ball pops up and, and seals it off. So you could get um, some, some sort of leakage that. So any air leakage pass, uh, let's see. So repairs, any air leak will be most noticeable where? Idle, wide open throttle, somewhere in the middle. Idle. idle. Why idle? Because you have the lowest amount of pressure. What does that mean? It means that there's the lowest pressure from the throttle plate to the, uh, to the engines. If it's wide open, it's close to atmospheric. So any, any small change in air will be super close. Yeah. Okay, so we have a pipe, right? So pretend like this is a pipe with air going through it on its way to the engine. At idle, what's inside of here? What kind of pressure? Which side are you on? Idle. Uh, no, like, uh, I mean, I'll like, yeah. Oh, on that side. Inside. So inside the tube, going to the cylinders, the intake manifold, at idle is a significant vacuum. So any little leak will... Be, uh, what's the word? Exasperated. Yeah, exasperated. It's going to suck in a bunch of air. At wide open throttle, what's the pressure like inside of the manifold versus right outside of it? They're almost identical. So a little bit of leakage, won't even notice it. Pull it back to idle. Now you got a big, it's really gonna. So if you, what would that look like on, a, on an engine? What would the symptoms be? Right. You got a shitty car? Come on, man. What's yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there leak? Uh, high you're running lean and, and you're running lean and, and ah. You know. Okay, you said high idle. Not really. No, okay, you're absolutely right. If you have a car, yeah. Why? Because it's, it's got a computer brain. Yeah, because yeah. it's, it's it's trying to adjust oh, for it. So it's going to add more fuel. Yeah. So you have more errors coming in. So the car, so the computer is going to say, well, we need more fuel. It's so it's going to. Be low idle, so you're going to get a high idle. What about on our engines that don't have a brain? You're the brain. Oh, well, that's not well, going to well. well, hmm? so well, you won't have a rise. What, what if it gets worse? You see it down. Will shut off. Too it won't, it'll run, engine will run really bad at idle. At idle. Mm -hmm. And it won't run bad at all at wide open throttle. Yeah. So how come my engine doesn't run at idle? Because you got such a big air leak. Well, we already said that. Oh, so we had a we had a customer one time. I was a customer. He was out at, at Clarksburg. And I remember it was one those, those foggy days we get where it's just fog for a month and a half. And so customers would come down and run their engine on the ground and just, you know, just to get it warm up. Is that a good idea or a bad idea? Bad idea. Okay, it's a bad idea. So it just makes things worse. So we'd come down. And I remember we had this one guy. And he started up and he ran it. And it's, you could hear it just sounded terrible. So he you know, shuts it down, come to the shop. And he asked the guy, oh, it just runs terrible. Well, you got to run it up more. Probably got a clinker in this, you know, in your, in your spark plug. Just run it up. Run the hell out of it, you know. Lean it out, too. And so he did that for hours. Oh, you know, and it's Jeez, still not. Still not. So finally, after, you know, forever and a day of listening to this thing, he finally says, all right, I'm going to, you know, can I taxi up the shop and have one of you guys look at it? Sure. What had happened is one of the exhausts had a little hole in it, and it blasted a hole through one of the rubber couplings on the intake tubes. 
So you had a hole that big on the intake tube. So it wouldn't idle. Take but it exhaust. ran well. Take an exhaust too, right? Yeah, and exhaust. Just blast it right into there. So, so he, he made it worse. Surprisingly, it didn't get better. <laughs> Uh, okay. How many pilots have you met? Yeah. How, yeah. Many, how many times is running the hell out of it really the right answer? Like maybe yeah, once. it's like... It <laughs> seems like that everyone's answer is not the right one. Yeah, just take it out run the hell out of it. Oh, it's either wear in or wear out, you know? It's <laughs> the easiest answer. It's yeah, you know? the first hour. He's like, you know what would help? Another hour of this. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. There's only one circumstance where that can actually work and that's if you've got a lead fouled spark plug or I suppose maybe oil fouled too if you can burn it off spark plug and you can do that so but that's that's it other than that don't don't do that uh, let's see um, installation says so we already know about everything up installation um, you should always use new gaskets. Um, but use caution with these gaskets. Uh, let's see, most, yeah, most gaskets or many, I'll say many gaskets, have the same bolt pattern. but different center cutouts. Who are my NASCAR fans? Come on, Kyle, you're not a NASCAR fan? <laughs> <laughs> Would have picked him. I know, I'm thinking about Joe Dirt, man. He's gotta be. Oh, Joe Dirt, yeah. He's got this guy watches NASCAR. Really? I don't have any NASCAR fans. Yeah, What's that? <laughs> he knows which way they turn. <laughs> so, a lot of these gaskets look exactly the same. You know, the bolt pattern's the same. But the uh, middle can be different sizes. What happens if you use wood with a too small of a hole in the middle? Well, the same problem we had with the head gasket. It's called a restrictor plate NASCAR. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so you got to make sure that you use one that has the right diameter center. Otherwise, you've just restricted it down. Now you're saying you did that with a head gasket when he was a kid changing the car's head gasket. And he didn't, he just put the head gasket on and didn't know. He's like, okay. And then he turned it on and all I heard is tink, 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 tink. Because he had a fucking smaller head gasket diameter. Yeah. Pistons hitting the head gasket. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he the rest of it. Nice. Except I know a little pisses, isn't it? Yeah. Hey, what's the deal with if you have like a paper gasket, you stick the paper gasket on, and then you install it, and you decide that you actually need to remove the part again, do you have to then put a new gasket on it, or can you reuse it if it's just, if it's not run? Or it depends on the part with depends on your right? Is yours or you know, I think the, the right answer to that is if once you've torqued it, you should change it. But what, what really happens? Let's reuse it. <laughs> people yeah. reuse until, until it, especially if they haven't run the engine or anything. But I. S what about how long and how far? What about cleaning off that gasket material? Can you do you just do you have scrape or do you use sandpaper or something like that? Like what's the off the off that carburetor? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Off that, anything, oh, that's stuck on it. Yeah. He's a razor blade. Yeah. Yeah. Sixty. I was a razor blade. Gas, gas and uh, what else we got here? Let me see. Uh, don't see. Well, it's time to go. So uh, we'll pick that up tomorrow.